Notes from the First Year was a magazine published in 1968. Shulamith Firestone had four essays in it, um, one reflecting on the first wave and its mistakes, one a dialogue between women talking about bad sex with men, one on the Jeanette Rankin Brigade, and finally one on abortion. My favourite bit from the sex dialogue is this. God, if I waited to fall in love, I'd be climbing the walls. Yeah, forget love if you could even just like him. Forget like, I'd be happy if I could only respect the guy a little bit. Respect, forget it. If you can even talk to him at all, you're lucky. Even just small talk about the morning orange juice. If you can even stand to wake up next to him. Can stand having his head on your pillow. A shocked silence. Do you realize what we're saying? Not only have we been sleeping with guys we don't love, but with guys we positively can't stand. So I think we see the seeds in this essay um, of the ideas that she would later develop in her 1970 book, uh, The Dialectic of Sex, which I'll talk about in another video. I want to talk mainly in this video about the abortion essay. So this was the um, text of a speech given at an abortion rally in New York on the 24th of March 1968. The rally was held in support of the Parents Aid Society, founded by Bill Baird. Baird had been a campaigner for women's reproductive rights since 1963. He distributed contraceptives from a, a converted van. He established university birth control clubs. He distributed literature on birth control and abortion. Um, he was involved in multiple Supreme Court cases and he was arrested on multiple occasions. At the time of the 1968 rally, he was facing a 10-year jail sentence. So Shulamith starts the essay by noting all the women who were not at the rally, women who she describes as afraid to take a stand on an issue as important as their own self-determination, women who were terrified to express support for Bill Baird, even though the risks he took were for women, women who were, quote again, scared shitless. But she has an explanation for their absence. Um, she writes, Woman is scared shitless, and she has good reason to be. She has been told to shut up and stop talking a million times. On a higher level, when she expressed concern for personal relationships, she is told haughtily that she is too subjective, too wrapped up in her own problems. If she dares to have a self, she is termed selfish and unfeminine. If she dares to have an opinion, she is called shrewish and opinionated. She has been told to stay at home where she belongs and not to meddle in important affairs, to leave the driving to us. Now, how can we be surprised that this woman has chosen to stay at home today? Oppressed, suppressed, depressed, and repressed all her life, we can hardly now expect to find her here standing up for herself. Against that huge male power structure which has always put her down, the awesome authority of which she well knows. How can we now expect that she be here when that lifelong intimidation in her is so deep rooted that even if you put her in solitary for 20 years, she wouldn't dare to think unkosher thoughts or to question her position in this society? For she has internalized its values, she has accepted, and indeed in many cases she has become its low estimate of her human worth. This is such an important point. It emphasizes the severity of the social conditioning that has been imposed upon women and what effects it has had on her. Having been so consistently repressed, how can she suddenly be expected to rebel, to demand her rights, to defend the man who has been fighting for them alone? And this also helps us to see what an incredible accomplishment feminism was. There's so much for women to overcome simply to have the realization that her treatment is unjust, let alone being prepared to suffer the costs of taking action on that realization. Still, by whatever means, Shulamith and a handful of other women had managed to have that realization and were prepared to act on it. 
And this action, speaking at the abortion rally, was aimed at increasing public support for women's reproductive rights, including the right to abortion. So Shulamith reminds her audience of how commonplace the need for an abortion is. Then she talks about how unplanned pregnancy was generally handled at the time, how a man was likely to deny that it was even his, um, or how he may grudgingly give her money to help her secure an abortion from an illegal doctor, or how he may even marry her but resent her for it, or how if she is married she'll be expected to take full responsibility for having and rearing the child even when it is unwanted. He helps her with her problem, uh, if he helps her at all, rather than their problem. And this situation was exacerbated by the fact that it was men who were most of the lawmakers in the country. Um, the very few women lawmakers at the time, either having been chosen because of their reactionary politics or because they were the wives of powerful men. Shulamith writes of this situation that it is a grand convention of dogs deciding the fate of cats. And she insists, these bodies belong to us. We don't have to appear in your courts proving our mental incompetence to you before we can avoid forced childbearing. And she goes on, driving home the point that there is a massive asymmetry between those making the decisions and those who the decisions affect. So she insists that women are not for men, but for themselves. She writes, We refuse to be your passive vessels becoming impregnated for the greater good of society. We want a society that exists for our good as well as yours. And she goes on, we are not just grease between men, links between generations, not just the mothers of sons and their future wives. We are tired of being ma pawns in a male power game, tired of being brought and sold and traded and used to sell your deodorants and hairsprays. So this is a point which extends way beyond the abortion issue and gets to the core of radical feminism itself, a movement that takes women seriously as people a movement that wants self-determination, freedom, autonomy, liberation for women. The lack of reproductive rights, including the right to abortion, was just one of the many bars of the cage that was keeping women trapped. So we'll talk more about some of the other bars in the next uh, Shulamith video. In the meantime, for those who want to learn more about her, um, the notes from the first year magazine is digitized at Duke University. It's free access, um, so I'll post the link in the video description. There's also a reenactment of an interview with Shulamith from 1967. So uh, this is not her, this is an actress playing her, um, but the words are hers. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem possible to get a hold of the, the original footage. And then finally, um, Susan Faludi's article, uh, Death of a Revolutionary on Firestone's uh, Life and Death, um, is absolutely wonderful. So I encourage you to check that out too.